It's been a week since the shocking incidents in Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, where thousands of Jair Bolsonaro supporters attacked federal buildings, including the office of the president, the houses of Congress, the Supreme Court. They vandalized artworks, destroyed public properties. There were officials inside. This, many people have called this a coup attempt, an attempt to sort of push back against the Lula government, which was legitimately elected in elections recently. We'll be talking about this incident and its implications in this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We have with us Prabir Prakash. Sir. Prabir, so uh, we talk, we've been talking about Brazil uh, in the past quite a few times, actually. And one of the things we talked about is the fact that the, there's Jair Bolsonaro lost the election, but he di did retain a strong support base, a support base of extremists, of fundamentalists, who would do anything to keep uh, Lula from coming back to power. Now, Lula did come back to power. He did take office. But what we saw was this incident last week when there was, uh, you know, a, a, an attempt at storming. So there are two questions there, I think. And the first thing is the fact that this actually happened, despite the fact that it was a capital city, despite the fact that at least there is supposed to be security. So first of all, could you take us through what are the implications of this event? Well, very clearly, it was a coup attempt which fell flat. It did not have any resonance in the country. Even Bolsonaro supporters did not come out in large numbers, as might have been expected, onto the streets of major cities. So given that it was, if at all, a, not only a damn squib, but actually something which would have strengthened Lula yeah. and weakened Bolsonaro. Yeah. So that is at one level uh, what we can think of as a conclusion of what has happened. Was it backed by the United States? Because that's the other big player in Brazil itself. Appears not. If they had succeeded, if they had been able to push back, maybe there could have been a Guaido-like uh, uh, attempt. But clearly, the United States was willing to take a hands-off position to see what emerges. And clearly, when it fell flat, then they did not throw in their support behind Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro right now is Florida. So is the ex-justice minister who took over the security of uh, Brasilia uh, in only, uh, I think, only the beginning of, uh, the beginning of the year. Beginning of the year. So he was not the person looking after the security earlier. So just before change of power that he took, uh, shall we say, charge of Brasilia. So the question remains, why did the governor of the province allow him to take charge of the district, which is a very sensitive uh, seat of power, of entire Brazil, in fact, and of course, not only of power, but also of the justice, Supreme Court, and so on. Why did this change? therefore uh, take place and why what was the governor doing in making him the head of this district particularly he was he was an ex justice minister so it does seem to be rather a small thing for him to take charge right. of so was there a conspiracy therefore becomes a question but i think the bigger issue is that it has delegitimized uh, this whole attempt and strengthen Lula. We must also understand the nature of Brasilia. It is not a city which has grown organically, yeah. unlike, say, the other bigger cities of uh, uh, Brazil, uh, unlike Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro. But uh, if we take that into account, Brasilia is an artificial city which has been created just to be the center of political power. It's, it was a new capital which was created and its only function is to be the federal capital. Okay. That's why all the institutions that you talked about are there. But there, there is no industry around, there is no other reasons why people are there except because the federal government is there. So in that sense, it does not have an identity in terms of, of its, itself. That means it's an organically long history behind it people's settlements. So therefore, there is nobody who's going to come in large numbers, either on this side or that side, because that happens in other large cities. Right. So this is the other issue that we didn't see any sympathy from any other city to this effort. It was an isolated event, and therefore it seemed to have flopped because it did not spark of any other response in the rest of the country. Bolsonaro is now outside, whether he will be implicated in this or not is a different question. But certainly, as a head of the security, uh, the ex-justice minister 
is going to be somebody who's in the eye of the storm. And it has been this, his issue has been raised, questions of his coming back, extradition, if not, are being talked about. But there's no question of the large scale collusion of the police and those who are supposed to guard the central uh, buildings, the, really the power centers, political, judicial, other power centers in Brazil, that there was no attempt by the police to safeguard them. And I, to anybody who's gone to Brasilia, it's a fantastic architecture. It's really brilliant uh, modern architecture by somebody who's pioneered uh, this kind of building, people's architecture, giving it a certain kind of orientation, and who was exiled during military rule. So, you know, he was in fact exiled to France during military rule. And this is something, therefore, uh, I think Oscar Neymar, whose, whose works are considered as, you know, heritage sites. So, the, this kind of uh, vandalism is something which is, speaks very, uh, speaks clearly or what kind of forces are arrayed against this, against what is the political processes which are going on in Brazil today. But let's not forget, they have some roots in society, clearly. Absolutely. That's a good point, Prabir, because uh, it's probably maybe a few thousands who were there at the site, but this is a sentiment that was probably shared very largely in many sections of society. But also because Bolsonaro, throughout his campaign, throughout his four years, has actually indulged in this kind of a politics of pol polarization, making Lula and his supporters appear like criminals, making them like communists, people who want to destroy society, people with whom Brazil is unsafe. And it is that sentiment that has been sort of bubbling because of these kind of campaigns. So also quite a few challenges for Lula ahead in terms of how to take things forward. Because while, like you said, this has become a moment of unity, we have governors from all across Brazil coming in solidarity. But nonetheless, as time passes, it's, it is nonetheless going to be a challenge to actually take the sections along as well. Well, it was going to be a challenge either way. I think this particular action of the Bolsonaro supporters has made Lula's task for the next one or two years easier because the really the fallout of this will be that nobody would like immediately mm -hmm. to side with forces trying to pull Lula down. So I think that way, this is uh, this will... This really helped uh, Lula and harmed Bolsonaro and his supporters. So I think that is one part of it. The second part of it, will it put Lula on the back foot internally? That is to focus much more on mm. Brazil itself and therefore deny him, deny him the role that he, we expect him to play, which is look at, for instance, alternate economic structures. Mm. How do we continue trade without the overarching uh, architecture of WTO because the United States has really collapsed WTO. There is not even a uh, tribunal which is a, which re, which when all these matters are uh, disputed, then there is an appeal which goes up. That body, the appellate body, has been sabotaged by United States. They have not nominated people on that body, and without that, it cannot proceed. So WTO at the moment structure exists, but it is because people are still following it, right. not because the structure is any teeth. So that is one. Then we have, of course, the much bigger issue: financial sanctions, the role of the dollar and using weaponizing dollar, and what is it countries can do in order not to be therefore held hostage because of their dollar contracts to the United States politically. So those issues we were expecting Lula to play a bigger role because it's not there for just China, Shanghai cooperation. Yeah. It is also India, China, Russia, Brazil, and South Africa. So you get the big continental players also on board. Though South Africa is a bit of an outlier in, in Africa, they're not really uh, taken in the sense that it represent, they represent Africa, but that we won't get into today. But looking at that, uh, and Brazil is center of a, a Latin American politics, let's make no mistake about that. India is perhaps not at the center, but at least a major important player in Asia, just as China is. So taking India and China together, yes, there is a lot of heft of Asia behind this. So Lula, if he is not able to play a role in BRICS, then it might be more difficult because India and China are, have tensions between themselves. Right. Right. Russia and India have some equation, as we saw in the oil deals that are taking place. But the role that Lula would have been much more successful in is if it can get the major continental players on board and therefore try a process, particularly on financial architecture, which allows 
at least uh, bypassing the dollar if necessary with other currency uh, agreements. And of course, there is also the one which the IMF, etc. Uh, has talked about. But none, nobody has really too much uh, belief on those uh, non dollar payment right. uh, currencies because they fear that uh, those things could also be under the U.S. hold because it's overwhelming power that it wields both in the IMF and in the World Bank. So given that, will multiple currencies take shape would be a very important issue, as well as in the, for instance, NATO, uh, Russia, Ukraine war, would Lula be able to play a role for peacemaking? Those are the kind of questions right. where I think his role will be more limited and he'll be much more restricted to Latin America, which maybe is uh, something which the United States would like to happen, but at the same time would not be seen to support. Because if they do that, then the Latin American part also goes. Right. Of course, maybe in this context, <clears throat> also useful to think of Peru, where we see another right-wing pushback. We know that President Pedro Castillo has been overthrown. A massive protest going on, close to 50 people uh, have been killed. And I think this throws a larger question in terms of some of these right-wing attempts that are taking place. Uh, we do know that there is, now we are, we are in the era of what has been a pushback against the right in general. Over the past two, three years, we have seen elections in many countries, progressive governments coming to power, not left-wing, but definitely progressive, or like you have said once, they are not pro-American at least. But also pushbacks taking place against many of these governments, Peru, like I said, being an example. So when we look at the continent in general, how do we sort of analyze these two trends? One of a general push against some of these neoliberal and uh, US-led processes, but also a very strong right-wing reaction. Well, let's put it, take, let's take a step back and look at this in a larger context. Yes, there are pushbacks, but the point is the pushbacks are not taken through military coups any longer. Mm -hmm. They're taking place through the judiciary, mm -hmm. through the legal system, trying to put uh, alternate centers of power, fighting in the elections using social media, big media, to combat the left or progressive forces in Latin America. So the nature of fight has changed. I think that's important. 80s, well, a direct phone call, and there you have the American motion play to overthrow elected government and put, put a military dictatorship in place. So instead of overt intervention, which was when the uh, this whole region was really Pax Americana, that you now have, instead of overt action, you now have covert action. You have what we have discussed as lawfare. Mm. And more importantly, that even the lawfare has a term. Okay, it goes for two years, three years, like Lula, five years, then it tends to fail. So the larger legitimacy, if you look at that, then the political or the popular pressures for legitimacy now are trumping the kind of covert action which the United States has been unleashing, which earlier was coups, now is various legal action of different kinds, and also electoral coups of different, uh, in different ways. So I think that is a positive. In this case of Pedro Castilla, they could dismiss him, but the government which has come in place has, is finding it very difficult to continue. Its legitimacy is very much being challenged. And therefore, for all practical purposes, it's not recognized as legitimate. The fact that it has to really indulge in this kind of slaughter. Peru is a very small country, 4 million people. So 47 is a very large number compared to that. It also shows that if you don't have legitimacy, what do you have then? So I think for even the right, or those who have displaced Pedro Castillo because he, not all of them are rightists. Let's face it, it's one of the uh, persons in his government which is also leading this particular formation at the moment. I think it is, it's really, it would help Peru much more if they did what the people are asking, go for election. So immediately the, all this would stop. All they have to say, three months, four months, five months, we'll face an election right. and therefore give us the time to put everything in order and hold the elections. I think that's the only really democratic way to go. And the fact that this is not being done shows the, shall we say, the lack of good faith in why they have displaced uh, Castillo, overthrown Castillo, 
and the forces behind it, which may appear to be the judiciary, it mm -hmm. is not. It is really a larger political uh, compact, which is hidden. Who are funding it, who are supporting it, I think we are pretty clear that it will be the United States. But I think this part of it makes sense that unless they get people's legitimacy, this is going to continue. And the people have shown that this government does not have hold people's popular legitimacy. I think that's very clear Absolutely. to everybody. Right. Thank you so much, Rabir. So there we have it, a uh, continent which is going through a lot of crisis, probably going to become one of the most important fault lines in the coming years is progressive forces on the one hand and right-wing forces on the other contest and try to sort of establish supremacy. We'll be covering many of these aspects and issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching NewsClick.